Hello there, welcome to my channel on chemistry lessons. Predominantly it focuses on AQA A level, but it also covers the BTEC applied science specification as well. All my videos so far do focus on full lesson content and are meant to be as interactive as possible for you to follow along and answer questions. And they are currently following the AQA A level chemistry specification. So please make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on any future videos. Um, great, good luck. Hope you enjoy. So this lesson then, it's a lesson two in a series of three and it's on the AS organic alkanes topic. Um, the last video looked at the properties of alkanes and in particular the fractional distillation and cracking of alkanes and this one now is going to look at how we actually use those fuels once we've got them. So it's kind of the combustion of alkanes and any problems that may bring with it. So there's our specification. Now the, the concern here that I have is quite often students have covered something similar to this at GCSE and they think that they already know everything. So it's tempting to say to yourself, I've done this already, but actually there's an awful lot more detail here that you won't have done at GCSE. So it will feel familiar, but there's definitely some new bits that you won't have covered. Okay. So we're going to look at what is combustion, so complete, incomplete combustion, that will be very familiar, but the ones, bits that won't, we're going to look at the specific pollutants, where they come from, the problems they cause, and how we can remove them. Okay, so let's look at complete and incomplete combustion then. This bit is identical to GCSE, okay, and the idea that combustion takes place, it's the reaction of your hydrocarbon, CXHY, with oxygen. And if you've got a plentiful supply of oxygen, then you would get complete combustion, which is carbon dioxide and water. And if you were to have an insufficient oxygen supply, then you will produce either carbon monoxide and water, or you could produce carbon soot and water. So be careful in the exam questions there because you would be expected to balance these. Okay, so you'd be expected to balance them. And if it says incomplete, it can either be, you can choose as carbon monoxide or carbon. Sometimes though it might specify in the exam, they might say incomplete combustion that produces a toxic gas. And that would be your expectation there that you would go for carbon monoxide. Or it may say incomplete combustion that produces soot which is carbon. So just be careful. Sometimes they will specify in the exam which one they want. Now, if it's complete, it's always carbon dioxide and water. So I have to go with the top one for complete. And then you need to balance it. I've just done a very, very general equation here. You would need to practice balancing them. And likewise, with your carbon monoxide, you need to be aware that carbon monoxide is a highly toxic gas. You don't really need to know the information about that, but many textbooks will talk about carbon monoxide binding to the haemoglobin in blood. And therefore, what it does is it, it prevents your blood from being able to carry oxygen. And that's why it's toxic. Hence the term why incomplete combustion is dangerous. And incomplete combustion, again, just to be clear, when there's an insufficient supply of oxygen. OK, so I've left the spec up in the top right corner here because alkanes are used as fuels that's kind of almost self-explanatory the idea of complete and incomplete I've just gone over that briefly in the previous slide but we tend to have a good knowledge of GCSE from that and um, just balancing the equations that you've got to be careful with now moving on to the pollutants then we do need to know about the pollutants and you can see the spec is quite clear in the ones we need to know so let me list the ones that are there first of all so we've got n or x and i'll go through each of these in turn we've got n or x we've got c o we've just kind of seen that one and we've got c we've seen that one and unburned hydrocarbons so some fuel can pass through the engine and be you know be unreacted so this is all about the internal combustion engine right here there's also some others that we'll produce so we will produce carbon dioxide we will also produce water and there's another pollutant that we'll see SO2 and it does you'll see that in your spec a little bit lower down about combustion of hydrocarbons containing sulfur can lead to sulfur dioxide so I'm going to put that in our table here 
Okay, so we need to go through each one of these. Now, not all of these are classed as pollutants, but these are all of the substances that will come out of a car exhaust. So these are all things that would be produced in an internal combustion engine. So we need to know where does it come from. So NOx. The reason we say X is because there's different oxides of nitrogen. Okay, so there's different oxides of nitrogen. It could be NO2, could be N2O5, could be NO. So there's different oxides of nitrogen. So we just call them NOx to cover all of the bases or the oxides of nitrogen. And where does that come from? Well, it comes from nitrogen and oxygen in air because air contains mostly nitrogen and oxygen. But inside the combustion engine, because it's such a high temperature and pressure, nitrogen and oxygen will react together to form oxides of nitrogen. So high temp and high pressure causes oxides of nitrogen. And why are oxides of nitrogen pollutants or what problems do they cause? Well, oxides of nitrogen, those are the chemicals responsible for photochemical smog and also some acid rain. So oxides of nitrogen will cause acid rain and photochemical smog. They come from oxygen and nitrogen reacting in the high temperature and high pressure inside the engine. Okay, so CO, where does that come from? Well, we've seen that already. It's the incomplete combustion and what's the conditions there it's when you've got insufficient oxygen and the problem that causes is it's toxic or poisonous to animals so it's toxic or poisonous to animals and carbon again that's incomplete combustion from insufficient oxygen and what does that do well it can cause issues with asthma, asthmatic people. Tend to not really be asked this one, if I'm honest. It's soot, okay? And it can cause lung irritations. Unburnt hydrocarbons then, with origin, this is just unburnt fuel. So unburnt fuel, the conditions, well, just don't really need to say anything else other than it's unburnt fuel. And what problems does that cause? Well, it can cause, again, respiratory issues. Okay, it can cause respiratory issues. Hydrocarbons can also be carcinogenic. So respiratory issues or carcinogenic for your unburnt hydrocarbons. So as you can see, some pretty nasty things come out the back end of a car, which is why you shouldn't stand behind cars and you shouldn't breathe in fumes. Moving on then, carbon dioxide. This comes from the complete combustion. So that comes from complete combustion. The conditions are plentiful oxygen, plentiful O2. And the problem that that causes is that causes global warming. So far, that's the nicest of, of the four, of the five. So global warming for CO2. And water, well, water is just because the hydrocarbon, so it's just combustion. It's just the combustion of fuel. The fuel contains hydrogen. We produce water. Not really much else for me to put there. Not really any problems caused by that. Yes, water vapour can also lead to global warming, but I wouldn't necessarily call water a pollutant here, so I'm not really going to give that too much time. Sulfur dioxide, though, definitely. Now, sulfur dioxide comes from impure fuels. So impure fuels. And that is, unfortunately, that is most fuels. Fuels will contain low levels of sulfur. You may have recognised sometimes when you go to the petrol station, when you fuel, some um, places advertise low sulphur fuel. And they've obviously made attempts to remove some sulphur from their fuel. The issues that that causes, though, is any sulphur that is in the fuel inevitably is burnt. OK, so the conditions, it's just combustion. When you burn the fuel, you also burn the impurities. So when you burn the impurities, you've got sulphur reacting with oxygen to make sulphur dioxide. And the problems that causes is acid rain. So your main pollutants here, the ones that we kind of most common, oxides of nitrogen, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide. Okay, but we do need to be aware of all of those really, where they come from and the problems they cause. Okay, the next slide we're going to look at 
how can we reduce the levels? So what do we do to reduce those levels? What do cars have to reduce those levels? So internal combustion engines are fitted with a catalytic converter. It's law in this country. So your cars have an exhaust system. Industries have similar, but it's not a catalytic converter. It's, it's classed as a flue system. A flue system is where waste gases pass through. So what does a catalytic converter do then? So you're going to get to see my drawing skills here, which is not that great. So after your engine's done its thing, the gases come out and they are passed through an exhaust or a catalytic converter and then out the back of your car into the atmosphere. So what's coming out your engine is oxides of nitrogen, unburnt hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide, and yes, water vapor and carbon dioxide, but they will just pass through freely. They're not classed as pollutants. So what your cat catalytic converter does is convert these three things into less harmful or less damaging things, such as carbon dioxide, water vapor, and nitrogen. So you can see that the three things coming out cause far less issues than the three things going in. So we need to look at what's actually happening in here. So what happens, what magic takes place in here. And we need to look at some equations that accompany that. So inside your catalytic converter, if you were to look under the car, it's actually quite a large box. And the idea is that this box contains like a honeycomb structure, kind of like inside a beehive. And that honeycomb structure is made out of a ceramic, which is relatively cheap and it's to give it a big surface area. So it's got like a ceramic honeycomb and that ceramic honeycomb is coated in platinum, palladium and rhodium metal catalysts. So we've got three types of catalyst on the surface here. And what that's hence the term catalytic converter. Those catalysts are there. And what they're gonna do is aid or speed up the reaction between these three things into these three things okay so what happens is oxides of nitrogen will react with carbon monoxide to produce carbon dioxide and nitrogen so that's quite useful and what will also happen is any unburnt hydrocarbons will undergo combustion and will produce carbon dioxide and water it's as simple as that, okay? It's worth pointing out here, it's not on your spec, but it's definitely interesting, that your catalytic converter only works when it gets warm. So when you first start a car, when it's cold, your exhaust fumes are far more toxic and dangerous than they are when it's warm. So your catalytic converter doesn't work for the first kind of 20 minutes, whatever. So if you're only do, ever doing short journeys, you're producing an awful lot of pollutants. It's only once the exhaust gets warm. And that kind of makes sense that once it's warm, the rate of reaction increases, these conversions take place. If it's cold, these don't take place. Okay? But we do need to know the equations of what happens in a catalytic converter. We need to know the catalysts. We also need to be aware that it's a honeycomb structure and it's only a coating. So it's a ceramic structure and it's a coating of platinum, palladium and rhodium. Why do you think that is? Well, if it was solid honeycomb, platinum, palladium and rhodium, it would be very, very expensive because these metals are precious and expensive. So if we just plate the ceramic, it makes it cheap, kind of like jewellery. If you buy a solid gold ring, it's expen expen expensive. If you buy a cheap gold ring, it's another metal that's just been plated with gold. So the idea, the same idea in a catalytic converter, gives it a large surface area which means there's a bigger area for these reactions to take place. And you will learn more on catalysts in year two. An industrial flue system then works slightly differently. And the focus for this is how it removes SO2. So how do we remove that sulfur dioxide that causes acid rain? Well, a flue system uses either calcium oxide slurry so calcium oxide, or it will use calcium carbonate. It will use one of those two. 
And what happens is it reacts with the sulfur dioxide. And in the case at the top, it makes cal calcium sulfite, which is SO3. So you can see it's removing the SO2. And you also make the same with the calcium carbonate. But you also make carbon dioxide in this one. So that's the only difference. OK. And then what happens is this calcium sulfite is then converted using an oxidizing agent into calcium sulfate, which actually has industrial uses. It's called gypsum. So they're able to turn this sulfur dioxide and calcium oxide slurries or calcium carbonate slurries into something useful. But the key point is that the gases are passed over this slurry or through this slurry and sulfur dioxide is removed and therefore it's not passing out into the environment and it has been removed and reducing that risk of acid rain. Okay then, time for you to have a go at a couple of exam questions. So you know the drill, pause the video, complete the question and then when you're ready to go over it, unpause the video. Okay, so hexane is C6H14. Now the straight chain would be just six carbons in a row. One, two, three, four, five, and six. So it can't be straight chain, so we can't go for straight chain. It must be branched. The easiest way to do it would be to pick five. So to look at methyl pentane or two methyl pentane or possibly three methyl pentane. Those would be the, probably the, the most obvious ones. You could also pick dimethyl butane and there's two versions of dimethyl butane and that isomerism is called chain isomerism part c then so this is asking us to write a, an equation for the combustion of hexane but it's saying when the air inlets are partially blocked so that's your key then to recognize its incomplete combustion so c6h14 plus oxygen and it's going to be incomplete combustion, which means it's going to be carbon monoxide. Or you could go for carbon soot. So I'm going to give you two correct answers here. So I'm going for the carbon monoxide. We could also have gone for carbon soot. So we'll do both equations because either are correct. Now to balance it, carbons, six and six, because there's six carbons. And for the water, we need seven water in both cases. Now on the left, we need six and a half oxygens, because six and a half times two is 13. We've got 13 on the right. Over on this side, on the right hand side, we only need three and a half oxygens. So it must be balanced. Either of those two equations are correct. And suggest how that might affect the performance. Well, less power would be produced. So less energy would be given out or less power would be produced. The engine would be less powerful, it'd be less efficient. So any of those, it's only worth one mark. Not sure why they give you three, three lines to write it, but any idea of um, it would be less powerful. Now, if you've gone for the idea of the carbon monoxide poisoning, you are incorrect because it's specifically asking you about the performance of the helicopter. So you can't talk about carbon monoxide being toxic here. It wants a specific comment on the performance of the engine, which is less powerful. Okay, next question is a multiple choice then. So pause the video and when you're ready to go through it, unpause the video. Okay, so here we're asked for the incomplete combustion of pentane. So pentane C5H12. Are they all C5H12 with oxygen? Yes, they are. The top one, though, is complete combustion, so it can't be the top one. It's complete. All of the rest appear to be incomplete, apart from the bottom one, look. Hydrogen, so it's not D. So I've eliminated the two pretty quickly here. And then if you look for balancing, the only one of those two that is balanced is C. The answer here is C. Okay, next question then. So, you know, pause the video and when you're ready to go over the answer, unpause the video. So a little bit of revision here on how to determine an empirical formula. So we know it's an oxide of nitrogen and we know the percentage by mass of nitrogen. So the first thing we need to do 
is work out the percentage by mass of oxygen. So 100 take away 25.9, and that leaves us with a percentage of 74.1. So 74.1% oxygen and 25.9% nitrogen. Divide by the atomic mass. Leaves us with 1.85 for the nitrogen and for the oxygen is 4.63. Now we divide them both by the smallest one, which is 1. 4.63 divided by 1.85 comes in at 2.5. So the ratio is 2.5 to 1. Simplest whole number ratio is 5 to 1. Sorry, 5 to 2. Multiplying them both by 2. So our empirical formula is N2 or 5. Okay, so for N O then, it could form acid rain, that's one thing, acid rain, or photochemical smog. Those are the two things that we mentioned earlier in the video. So we're looking at either or acid rain or photochemical smog. The oxide NO reacts with oxygen to form nitrogen dioxide. Construct an equation. Check that it's balanced. Is it balanced? Not quite. In order to balance it, we need a two here and a two here. And how NO is produced in the engine of a motor? Well, the key point here is that we have high temperature and high pressure. Nitrogen and oxygen will react. So nitrogen and oxygen in the air will react under extreme temperature and pressure. So high temperature and high pressure. Now showing how NO is removed. If you recall earlier, NO reacts with carbon monoxide to produce carbon dioxide and nitrogen. Balancing it out. Two, a two, and a two. So there we go. Okay, last question then, question four. So pause the video, go over the question. When you're ready, unpause. Complete combustion of butane. Butane is C4H10. Combustion is with oxygen. Complete will make carbon dioxide and water. Now we need to balance it. There'll be a four here. There'll be a five here. And now we'll add up the oxygens. We've got eight plus five, 13. So we need six and a half here, 6.5. So 6.5 or two. There we go, one mark. State a condition which may cause carbon to be formed as a product in the combustion of butane. That would be insufficient oxygen. Simple as that, insufficient supply of oxygen. Butane obtained from crude oil may be contained an impurity. When this impurity burns, it produces a toxic gas that can be removed by reference. So our trigger point here is the impurity in the fuel and that it could be removed from calcium oxide. So this is talking about sulfur being an impurity and the identity of the toxic gas here is SO2. It also causes acid rain. Why calcium oxide reacts with toxic gas? Well, calcium oxide is classed as a base. It's a base and SO2 is classed as acidic. So it will react with the acidic gas. So calcium oxide is a base. It's an acid-based reaction that we have happening there. So suggest why the calcium oxide is coated on a mesh. That is to give it a bigger surface area. So that's a, a slightly tricky one because you don't actually cover that part um, in the spec. But we did talk about the catalytic converter being um, a honeycomb and that giving it a larger surface area. So the exact same reason here is the mesh will give it a large surface area. That brings this video to an end then. So there's one more video to go in this series, which is the chlorination, the free radical substitution of alkanes. So hopefully you find them useful. Um, let me know what you think and good luck.